Uh, well, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Jack Knott, and I'm the Irwin and Ione Piper Dean and Professor of the USC School of Policy, Planning, and Development. And I'm so pleased to welcome you to the Center on Philanthropy and Public Policy's 10th Anniversary Forum. I'd like to begin the forum by recognizing the Center's Board of Advisors. The Board re represents a group of truly extraordinary leaders from philanthropy and the community who have made a significant commitment to the Center. And I want to particularly acknowledge Esther Wachtel, our founding board chair, who has provided immeasurable inspiration, encouragement, and support over this 10-year long journey. I'd also like to recognize the sponsors of this forum. Their generous support has enabled us to put together this outstanding program. They are Bank of America, the Eisner Foundation, Conrad Hilton Foundation, J.P. Morgan Chase & Company, Moss Adams LLP, NBC Universal, Philanthropic Administration Incorporated, United Way of Greater Los Angeles, the Center's Philanthropic Partners, the premier support group of the Center, and of course, uh, the School of Policy Planning and Development. Uh, we are so grateful to all of you for your support in making this forum possible. Thank you very much. As Dean of the School of Policy, Planning, and Development, I am very, very proud of the Center on Philanthropy and Public Policy and its accomplishments over its first decade. Indeed, my work with the Center prior to becoming Dean was one of the main reasons for my decision to come to USC. And I want to acknowledge at the start uh, Professor Jim Ferris, a good friend and colleague, for his outstanding leadership of the center and in the philanthropic community. He and his faculty college, colleagues undertake important research that helps us better understand philanthropy and nonprofits and the important role that they play in society and in the community. So thank you, uh, Jim. Thank you very much. The mission of the School of Policy Planning and Development is to produce future leaders and produce knowledge that provides innovative solutions to the most pressing issues facing society. Our ultimate goal is to improve the quality of life for people and their communities here and abroad. In fact, our school was one of the first public policy schools to recognize the importance of philanthropy and the nonprofit sector, in addition to government and business, in addition in solving our most pressing public problems. And the Center on Philanthropy and Public Policy plays a critical role by contributing to the school's educational offerings in philanthropy and nonprofit management, including the school's top seven ranking by US News and World Report for our nonprofit management program. And I am very proud that our center has brought you all together for this impressive program. In 10 short years, the center has become the premier convener of leaders from philanthropy and the nonprofit sector, government and business to discuss pressing issues affecting philanthropy and its role in public problem solving. This is the fourth national forum in which the center has engaged key decision makers, thought leaders, and researchers in discussions of critical issues to the sector. In addition, the center is known for its distinguished speaker series, the only convening of its kind in Southern California. Through this series, the center hosts nationally recognized philanthropists, foundation executives, and policymakers to address, address critical issues in philanthropy and the community. Speakers such as Teresa Hines, Judith Roden, Bill Gates Sr., Joel Fleischman, Eli Broad, Stir, uh, Sterling Spurn, and Paul Brest. The center is also 
rec regarded for its groundbreaking research and analysis. The center has undertaken numerous funded studies documenting the changing nature of philanthropy, examining strategies for leveraging philanthropic resources, and exploring issues in philanthropic leadership and accountability. These projects have generated numerous research reports and peer-reviewed journal articles. Recently, the center was recognized by the nonprofit Quarterly as an intellectual leader in the field. In 2009, they highlighted the center as one of five academic research centers that contributes to the philanthropic and nonprofit infrastructure through its research and educational activities. It is clear that the center has achieved many successes since its founding in 2000. And as is evident from the impressive gathering here, it has also laid a foundation for an even more prosperous and robust future. So I'd like to thank all of you again for joining us today for the center's 10th anniversary forum. And I look forward to stimulating conversations on how we can affect meaningful change in these truly extraordinary times. Thank you. And now I'd like to invite Jim Ferris to the podium. Thanks, Jack. Let me add my own welcome as well. I'm delighted that you are able to join us for this exploration of opportunities for philanthropic leadership in uncertain times. And I'm particularly glad to see so many of you that have helped to support and build the center through your involvement or who have impacted our thinking here at the center through your work and example, both here and across the country. So thank you all for coming. It was 10 years ago this month that the center was launched with our first forum, What is New About New Philanthropy? As we thought about how we should mark our 10th anniversary, the center's board came to the quick decision that we should once again bring together philanthropic decision makers, thought leaders, and researchers to consider th how things have changed over the past 10 years, where things stand today, and most importantly, where we are and think they should be heading. And I want to thank the board members who have helped to plan the program for today, Kathy Hessian, Jeff Hoffman, Antonio Manning, and Wendy Wachtel. They have been very instrumental in the design of the program. And of course, um, I didn't put this all together. Um, we have a team at the center who's really executed the plan, and that's Tracy Mendoza. Where's Tracy? Is she somewhere? There she is, behind that column. Kate Ogden, who might be at the front table still, and Christine O. Um, they have been the ones that have made um, tonight and tomorrow possible, so it's important to recognize them. You know, we learned from our inaugural gathering and our subsequent research here at the center that philanthropy was being fundamentally altered. It was occurring at a greater scale and a faster pace, it was becoming more complex and global and more pluralistic and individualistic. And while new philanthropy and existing donors with that kind of mindset were the catalyst for many of these changes, it was not so much an issue of new versus old, but rather one of evolution. These changes have continued to unfold in the intervening decade. New philanthropic institutions have been created, new models for giving have been invented, and strategies for greater leverage and impact have been designed. And while you know, we're in the middle of this current crisis, economic crisis, and there's much talk about resetting and starting anew, um, it's clear to me and us at the center that there have been significant transformations in philanthropy and that 
those are going to lay the foundation for what goes forward. Um, and so we're really excited to be thinking about what those opportunities are as we go forward. Um, just to outline the program for the next two days, tonight we're going to start with some keynote remarks from Sono Shaw from the White House Office of Social Innovation and Civic Participation. And then we have a stellar panel of leaders um, from every dimension of the sector to talk about sort of what those opportunities and what the implications are. And then tomorrow morning, we're going to start across the street in the Davidson Conference Center um, with an opening panel um, that Jim Canales is going to moderate on philanthropy itself and where it's heading. And then we have a series of concurrent panels that will allow you to drill down into a variety of topics. We'll look at how philanthropy can contribute to public problem solving, whether it be working directly with government or trying to influence it, whether it's through fostering social entrepreneurship, or even figuring out how to better link donors and recipients. Um, we will consider how philanthropy in the nonprofit sector is being advanced as a field, whether it's conversations about effectiveness and impact, whether it's a greater understanding by the public and policymakers about the sector, or whether it's about how to build the knowledge base for practice in the field. And finally, we're going to consider as well how we can expand the scale and scope of philanthropy. How can we engage new donors? What are the models for bringing more people into the philanthropic sector? And how do we reach younger generations, especially through new media? So there's a whole menu of exciting ideas. These are all themes that are important to the field, but is to the intellectual agenda of the center as well. So again, we're delighted that you're all here. We're glad to see a lot of familiar faces and some new faces. And I hope you enjoy and participate fully in the conversation over the next two years. So thank you for coming. Now it's my pleasure to introduce tonight's keynote speaker, Sonal Shaw. Sonal, we're so glad that you took that trip on um, Virgin America all the way to LA. Um, we're, Sonal heads the White House Domestic Policy Council's Office of Social Innovation and Civic Participation. The objective of the office is to coordinate governmental efforts to aid innovative nonprofit groups and social entrepreneurs, and to expand approaches which have been successful in tackling public pressing social problems. So Sonal served on President Obama's transition board, overseeing the Technology Innovation Government Reform Working Group. But prior to joining the White House, Sonal led Google.org's global development efforts focusing on transparency, openness, and civic participation, as well as growing small and medium-sized enterprises. Before her time at Google, she was vice president at Goldman Sachs, where she developed and implemented the firm's environmental strategy. Sono also co-founded and directed IndyCore, a US-based nonprofit offering fellowships for Indian Americans to work on development projects in India. And prior to that, she, she worked on trade outsourcing and post-conflict reconstruction issues at the Center for American Progress. As you can see, she's been quite busy. Um, and her, her, her time in and out of government. Um, and sort of interestingly enough, Sonal did her undergraduate work in economics at the University of Chicago and has a master's degree from Duke University. Sonal, we're delighted you're here. And we look forward to hearing what you have to say. Jim, I won't make any comments about North Carolina versus Duke. <laughs> 
Um, thank you for the invitation. Uh, thank you, Jim, for the introduction. Um, I feel like I should get out of Washington more often and have these introductions so I feel better about myself every day. <laughs> and, <laughs> but, uh, and, and thank you, Dean, um, Dean Jacknot, for, for inviting me and for the invitation to come here uh, to speak to, to all of you. Um, also really want to thank Tracy Mendoza. She's been fantastic in, uh, in arranging my trip out here because it, which, it, which kept changing because the data of the State of the Union kept changing. And <laughs> eventually we just had to agree that I was going to come on one day regardless of what date the State of the Union was, even though it's tonight. So, <laughs> uh, but it, it, I, she's been great and to, I really wanted to thank her for that. And uh, it was fantastic to be on, just before coming here, I went to go see, um, here, move this down. Uh, is it on? Yeah. <laughs> I guess you don't want to talk to me. <laughs> um, and it was great to, before coming here, uh, to spend some time with Nancy Ibrahim. And uh, thanks to Beatrice Solis for taking me to Mercado uh, Paloma, which was a fantastic site visit, and just to, to really see what's happening in the community and really seeing great programs. Uh, it was great. But let me thank you for uh, letting me come here. But let me just talk a little bit about kind of who we are, what we are in this office, what we hope to achieve. Um, I'll also lay out some of, you know, a year A year has gone by, what are some of the challenges that we've seen, and also where, um, give, leading into the next panel, where I hope we can talk a little bit more about uh, philanthropy and, and where the government is and some opportunities and some of the challenges. Um, the premise of the office was really that solutions to America's challenges are really taking places in communities already across America. Um, and what we want to do from a government and from the federal government perspective is to be able to find those solutions, to find those ideas and, and grow them, scale them, give them voice um, across different communities because sometimes what's happening in one community, it's not necessarily known what's happening in other communities. So that's the premise and it, it's located in the domestic, we're located in the Domestic Policy Council because we get to oversee programs across government. Uh, we're not lodged in the Department of Housing and Urban Development, we're not in education, we're not in, um, in any one particular area, we get, to, we get a purview across government which has been fantastic for us because it allows us to get a sense of how we can be more innovative, how we can think creatively, and really think about new ways to approach some of the problems that we've, we've been facing even within government. So our, our role is really to work with, you know, as Jim pointed out, to really work within government, but to make government a more dynamic player um, and not a static player in this process. Uh, and seeking out creative, results-oriented organizations, programs, ideas, and then catalyzing some of those even from within ourselves. How do we, how do we create some of those ideas? And I'll, I'll go through some examples in the process of this. The second part of our office is civic participation, um, which is critical for us, um, not only from what you've seen in the campaign, but also the idea of participating in communities. Solutions, while solutions are found in communities, it's also about participating in the communities. And this is something that's extremely important for the President and First Lady, creating pathways to service, getting communities to work uh, in their work and solve problems in local areas, um, and also thinking about how, how we make service a daily part of our lives. It doesn't matter the career you choose or the path you take, but that service becomes a part of who and what you are. And what we want to do there is create more pathways for everyone to be a part of service, encourage a lifetime of service, and uh, achieve results through service. Show that by, by giving in communities, we can also solve problems. And we're guided by a couple of principles. One, uh, that the role of government needs to be uh, limited and defined. So we need to know what our role is and what, what can we really do in this space. And secondly, focus on the niche that we can have as the federal government. Um, sometimes uh, there may be, we, we get a lot of ideas of what we should do and sometimes when we step back and think about it, we're not really sure we have a role in it as much as it is sometimes sharing information across uh, spaces. But we think our role sometimes might be getting out of the way. Sometimes it is, um, it's sharing information. Sometimes it's using the bully pulpit. And sometimes it's money. Um, and sometimes it's a combination of those. But really, really taking a hard look at what our role is and what we should do. And everything that we approach, we try to approach it with that lens. So how do we approach this broadly? And what, what does our office do? Uh, First, let me, we, I talked a little bit about the civic participation agenda. It's really investing in 
the leadership in communities and, generate, and building the next generation of leadership in civic participation. Uh, the Serve America bill was a very concrete example of that, moving AmeriCorps. Well, let me just talk a little about the Serve America bill. Uh, we talk about bipartisanship right now uh, and partisanship, but the Serve America bill passed in five weeks. And the, for, for Washington, that's, that is an enorm enormously fast time frame in which a bill can get passed. Healthcare would be a good example to di uh, as a dichotomy to that. But in five weeks it passed and it had a bipartisan majority supporting the bill. And that was the first bill that came out of Congress um, that the President talked about in the State of the State Address last year, State of the Union Address last year, and uh, was, was completed, which was extremely important um, and something that was important to him and the First Lady. But more importantly, that it was also bipartisan. So we had support uh, both both on within both parties, and there was a lot of support for the idea of civic participation. Uh, so what, what the Serve America bill offers is it grows AmeriCorps from 75,000 members today to 250,000 members. And the aim of that, and there's a pathway to that, but the aim of that also, there's a lot more in the bill, which is how do we create more ways for people to serve? How do we find ways in which people can serve wherever they are? It doesn't mean you have to take a six-month period off or a year off, but you can find other ways to give in your communities. And how do we build the next generation of leadership? Uh, training for nonprofits, building a volunteer generation fund, Fund to build the capacity to, to get the capacity building to manage uh, to manage volunteers, but all of that is an important part of that bill, and that is something that we take very seriously. And one thing that we have a new management team that's going to be joining um, very soon, a new CEO, hopefully that will get confirmed soon, who also comes from the philanthropic community, uh, Patrick Corvington, but really taking. AmeriCorps and the Corporation for National and Community Service to its next level and making service a part of the government, not just um, everyday lives, but how can government do more in this and really work across agencies. Second, uh, we want to get from service to solutions. So we've had the great Thousand Flowers Bloom model, everybody go out, do something in your communities, but how do we also show that we're achieving goals and using the new uh, the new bill to, as an opportunity to say we can use service to congregate around problems and try to solve small big problems and at least put our mind put our energy towards and the service towards that and that's an important aspect of where we want to go and re-emphasizing um, you know the core American principle that uh, that the philosophy of service which exists in every community is an important part of who we are and giving those pathways and, and re, re emerging that idea again. To get there, uh, we so we build a generation of leaders. The next bit that we recognize that it's not any one community that can do this by themselves. The problems that we're talking about require greater partnerships. Uh, partnerships between government, between civil society, between philanthropy, and between government, uh, and between business. Because it is not, the convergence of that is coming together more now than ever before. Government alone can't solve the problems. Business alone can't solve the problems. It's not always their problem to solve. Civil society needs government and business. Uh, and philanthropy works with all groups. So how do we bring those ideas, that, that expertise together to really solve problems and leverage that expertise? Not as a transaction. Um, I want, you know, I need this problem solved, therefore you should go pay for it and do it, or, uh, or I'm going to contract that problem out and somebody else can solve it. But really thinking about how those partnerships can come together. And I'll give you an example of one that we have um, recently announced. The President announced the importance uh, in the last uh, State of the Union and also throughout the year, the importance of science, technology, engineering, and math education. Um, we call it STEM as a, as, a, as a shorthand. And that part, it's been so important. And so there's parts of STEM that are very important. One, how do we get kids interested in science, technology, and math education? Second, how do we um, bring where, where are kids learning and how do we bring those communities in to help address that? And how do we build the next generation of teachers that can help teach in that? So in that, we developed a partnership with a variety of groups. Uh, we developed a partnership with the uh, Technology Industry Association. We developed a partnership with, um, with nonprofits. We've got government in there. And this, non this partnership is really looking at, so we're working with the media companies on how to get information out to 
uh, to young students on science, technology, engineering, math education to get them interested and at least put that on the radar screen. We're working with the community uh, that builds video games on thinking about how video games can more incorporate science, technology, engineering, and math into the video games because many kids are playing video games, so can we get to them where they are and how do we think about it differently? We're working with tech companies on how do we build the next generation of teachers and can they give opportunities for their employees and others to come and teach in schools and offer the, the education? Um, and the government, the Department of Education, National Science Foundation, and uh, NASA have come together to build a pipeline also of, of scientists, engineers, and others to go teach in schools and to, build, uh, and to, and to invest in, in teaching in science and math. So this type of partnership is leveraging the strengths of different communities to come together. It's not a, it's not a partnership of, you know, we would love the media companies to go do X and we would love the, um, the, the science foundation to go, National Science Foundation could do its thing, but it's really a commitment that we've all made to seeing success in these areas. So our video games coming out. Um, is, there more, is there more interest in, in science and math education? And uh, are there more teachers? There's concrete goals that we're looking at. And these, this is a way for us to say, how can we build new types of partnerships and what are ways that we we can inject that into various parts. What's been very important out of this is while I can talk about one partnership or another, the language around government has become around how can we do partnerships better? What can we do differently? So while we can't do every partnership in the government and we're not going to do every partnership in the government, by highlighting a few and by doing some really high profile ones, what, what has become a norm in conversation is how do we do partnerships? How do we think about partnerships? Every time there is an announcement that's coming up, in, even in the White House, somebody asks whether there's a partnership we can build. Should we be working with other groups? What should we be doing differently? So that norm and that normative change is part of the process um, of which we've learned it's taken a year to get to. So we thought when we came in, we could do a lot of these things rather quickly and we'll build these partnerships, but it's taken some time to get the agencies and others to understand how, what, and that it's possible for them to do. Um, second, I, I, the, the last piece of this is so we, partnerships is an important part. The last piece is also thinking about capital and how capital is deployed. And what can the government do in this space? We, we have funded the same programs over and over again. We have certain formulas. We have certain ways that we do things. But we should be finding those programs that are working. We should be finding ways to scale those programs. And we should be finding ways to be more creative about how to find the best programs out there. So one way of doing that is we've started, in, and to set an example, uh, at the Corporation for National and Community Service started a fund called the Social Innovation Fund. It's in that fund, which I'll give you a little bit more detail on, it's, there's two parts of the fund that are very important. One, that it's at, it's not within a particular agency. It's not in health and human services. It's not in education. It's not in, um, in housing and urban development, but it can fund programs across the spectrum. It can fund a health program, it can fund an education program, it can fund a housing program. Um, it's got the ability, it can fund a child nutrition program, it can fund a variety of programs in the spectrum. And because it's in the Corporation for National and Community Service, what it allows us to do is find the best programs and, and invest in scaling them. This capital is not meant as, it's meant as growth capital. So for, for the nonprofit community, it means, uh, it means overhead. Um, but the ability to invest in that, the ability to hire good people, the ability to invest in the technologies, the ability to invest in scaling your operations and really thinking about the marketing and what, it, what is needed to make that happen. And that, that has been an important aspect of getting the government to think differently because in general we only fund programs, we don't fund growth. And we're happy to expand the number of people coming into a program, but we're not willing to expand the ability for the organization to do more. And that, that has been an important part of that. So that one $50 million fund, which has two implicit matches in there, one, um, it, first it, it, is invest, it invests in intermediaries. It does not go directly to nonprofits. It goes to an intermediary who can invest in nonprofits. So community foundations, um, new venture philanthropy type organizations, um, foundations others can apply for that. There's no, there's no limit on intermediaries who can apply for it. Second, um, once those organizations, from, once the intermediaries make investments, they have, those organizations also have to get a match. So it's two matches um, and that, need to, that need to be there. And what we've been working with is we've been working with philanthropy and, and individual philanthropists to 
build those matches into that fund because it is a tough environment and because it is hard to get matches right now, but to show that this is an important way for government to do business differently. Now that has started a whole conversation at various agencies, including the Department of Labor, including Housing and Urban Development, including HHS, to say how can we do funds like that in our agencies? Uh, what can we do and what are the principles by which you might start them? So it may not look exactly like this fund, but the conversation has changed because we're looking at how do we use our money more uh, valuably? How can, we, how can we be smarter about this? And in this requires uh, transparency. Uh, and, and all of this I will get to is important as transparency, evaluation, and metrics. Uh, in order to say something works, we have to know what it is that we define as what works. And that, for the government side, it means we need to define what it is the problem we're trying to solve. <laughs> And not, uh, and not just a policy idea, but the problem. And secondly, from the nonprofit side, really saying, um, let's put the metrics out there. Is it working? Is it not working? What is working and what is not working? And as we go into tougher budget environments, that conversation is more critical now than ever because we do have to, we have to be smart about where we're spending our money. We have to be willing to say something's not working. And if it isn't working, either change the way we're working it so it can be effective or cut a program and move to, move to something that is working. But we, we know that that's a recognition on both. It's not just cutting off a program. We also need to understand what's not working and how it can be more effective. And then third, how do we create more incentives for change to happen? Sometimes it may not be what we do or the money we give, but the incentive we create. So an example of that is the, the race to the top fund that the Department of Education has done. It's a $4 billion fund which has gotten 40 st states to have legislative conversations on how they might apply for that fund. Now that in itself is a very interesting, the impact of the fund being out there has started a conversation in local communities of applying whether they should apply, whether they shouldn't apply, should they change their laws, shouldn't they change their laws, how do they want to improve their schools. That's, that's an amazing impact that an, that's an incentive that's been created that's greater than the value of the money that's put on the table. And while it, $4 billion seems like a ton of money and it is a good incentive, the fact that 40 districts are applying plus some, plus more, um, puts out there that the conversation has become very interesting about what race to the top means. And can we create other types of incentives that we can do that allow us to to change the conversation on effectiveness, to change the conversation on results, to change the conversation on what success means and how do we get there. Now, this is all good and I can say uh, we can do some of these things and we're trying to do as much as we can in the process of this, but we can only do so much and we need help. Um, one of the, there's a few lessons I could say that we've had over the year. A lot, one, we thought we could do a lot very quickly and it took some time to create culture change. It took some time to get people to think differently. It's taken time to keep injecting ideas in, in different places that others might think just a tad bit differently. We could do a partnership, we can create a fund, we can run a prize. How do we get new ideas in and how might we think about that? That's taken at least a year for us to get to. Second, um, we've had to understand the legal constraints in which we can operate. Um, we, you know, some things we thought we could go do, we can't do. We can't ask philanthropy to match dollars. The White House can't make those asks. We can't, uh, an ed you can work with an agency and an agency could potentially ask it. An agency, some agencies don't have the ability to run prizes. Uh, even though they want to do a prize, they legally can't do a prize. So we've had, we found ourselves having to work through a lot of the legal issues around this. We wanted to do more open source technologies, but the government, it's a little bit hard to do open source technology. So we've had to work through that process. So there's a lot of processes in place that we've had to work through that have taken us longer to figure out how to change the laws or to figure out how to work within the legal constraints or to see if we can find other ways to work around the legal constraints. Maybe it needs to sit outside of government. Maybe it should be somewhere else. So those are the types, the, that, that's one of the challenges that we've had to work through. And the third I would say, and for all of you, lack of information. So there's a lot of information in small pockets 
but we don't have aggregated information. So we're trying to make macro policy change or macro changes, and, and um, you know, Diana hopefully will talk about this in the panel a little bit more, but we are getting, we get a lot of anecdotal information, and from anecdotal information, we're trying to make policy change. And what, what is needed sometimes is to know what are, what's happening in the nonprofit community, what's happening in the social business community, in a macro scale, what should we be thinking across policy lines, um, and that we should be, what are the policies we should be advocating for? Should we go talk to SBA? Should we go talk to um, the Department of Treasury? What do we need to talk to them about? Um, and those are, when we, when we have only bits of information, it's hard to go into an, economic, arg an, an econo economic discussion and say, but you should do this, and they'll say, well, what's the data say? We're like, well, we have, anecdotal, we have anecdotal data that tells us that this happened in Michigan and this happened in Iowa and this happened in California, but we, we need aggregated information that helps us make better decisions and also to think about the policies because sometimes the policies can also be detrimental if we don't think them through more effectively. What we think we're trying to solve may actually cause more problems than, than, than solve those problems. So m my question and my op the opportunity here is to think about how can we work with academia, how can we work information that you all have in your philanthropies, how can we aggregate some of that information and show what's possible and what are the policy changes that need to take place or what could we be, we be doing more, more um, together. Second um, to that is, is there a way we can share information better? You all have invested in many organizations. You've taken risks on investing in organizations. How do we share that information, both with government but across lines, so people can take something that might work in LA and try it in Sacramento or try it in New York if the, if the situations are there? And we're trying it in some places. So we're trying to replicate promised neighborhoods throughout the country. Um, with that, we're working with the Department of Housing and Urban Development on choice neighborhoods. So housing and urban development and education are coming together to, to create um, what Jeff Canada has created in New York City, but can we, can we do that more often, more regularly? But we need that information, and we need to know what of that worked the best, and how can we do that more regularly? So is there a way to share that information from where you all are to, for us to, uh, to share, to think about the effectiveness? And, and I say share information not only on what works, but also on what doesn't work, because uh, we don't need to recreate those problems ourselves. <laughs> And we don't really need to, we could, we could learn from that and try to do things differently or say, maybe it doesn't work here, maybe we could still try it there, or how do we do that? So we, we could use that. But I'd say over the next few years, um, I hope we can work together to achieve results. Uh, we do have to show, if it, to get into the economic argument, we do have to show that we can achieve results. We can reduce maternal mortality rates, we can reduce um, high school dropout rates, we can reduce um, recidivism rates, that we have the ability to do that together. And how do we do those things together? How do we create the right sets of partnerships? How do we create the right sets of incentives? And then how do we use the energy around people wanting to participate to help address, address some of those challenges? Um, second, I hope that we can, I hope that you all will take a little bit more risk. <laughs> And I hate saying that from the government perspective because the government's not the biggest risk taker in the world. We have a board member, we have 535 board members um, every year that we have to justify our budget to. And it's hard to be a risk taker with 535 board members uh, to be, and, and, and it's, a, it's how you use your money, but we have to think about that. And we're not, what we can do is we can scale programs, we can help amplify what works and what doesn't work, but we're not gonna be the risk takers. And we need the risk to be happening somewhere so we know there might be new ways of using, tech, for example, technology to solve certain problems. But we're not gonna get there because we're not gonna, we're, we have to write an RFP for a technology that exists three years from now. We're looking backwards, we're not looking forwards in writing that RFP, but many of you have the ability to invest in a technology and see if it actually works. And if it works, can you get it to somebody so we can scale it? That's the type of that's the type of stuff that we need, but we just don't have. So the education system is a good opportunity to think about this. There's a lot of there's a lot of interest in getting data systems and technology and education, but we don't know which technologies and which which systems work very well. And every school district is going to need to have it. So where is that risk taking going to come from? And we need more of it because, and I'm not saying we shouldn't invest in those things that, sh that work. That, that is something that we have to do and that's something that the government is looking to do. But I also think we need to have some creative destruction in this space. 
um, things that work, things that if they don't work, it can die and move on to the next thing. But we need some of the what the business community has, which is businesses that start, businesses that go away. Uh, we need the same in this space, and we need to think about it more. And I don't know how we're going to get there, but I think that's something that's very important to us. We're trying to figure out how government's doing it. So the Education Fund and Department of Education, the I3 Fund, which is the Innovation Fund, has that. It's a three-part fund. One is purely innovation. The second is prove tested programs that have potential for growth, and the other is proven solutions. So we're, we're trying it in government, but again, I, I would only argue to say that this is not, we're not the best and in, most innovative spaces to be in. Um, we are good at taking what works and trying to scale it. We're also good at changing policy, and that's, that's, what, our, that's what our role is. So risk taking is an important part of that. Um, I'll leave it there because I think the conversation after this will be a good conversation for us to talk about some of these things. Um, I, really, I really do think there's a huge opportunity, if there's anything I can leave behind here, to partner in a variety of different ways. Please don't take away from this as partner as like, we just need your money. Uh, take away from this as in a partnership, we need your ideas. Um, we need to know what you've been doing and what's working and what's not working. But there's an openness in Washington, there's an openness in this office, and there's an openness across agencies to want to figure out how to solve these problems in a more effective manner. And really looking at where those solutions are happening and how, how we can learn from them and do something about it. And what I hope is that you will, you will think about uh, leveraging the government, leveraging our office, um, but also if we can't help you, we're happy to put you in touch with others, but really thinking about how you can work uh, with us or how we can work with you in terms of uh, of finding many of these community solutions and really solving some of the problems in our communities. So thank you for the opportunity and I look forward to the conversation. Thank you, Sonal. Um, I think um, if nothing else, you have a better sense, at least I did after hearing that, about this office is very different than what I imagined or read about. It's not this little office tucked in the White House trying to spend $50 million for a social innovation fund, but rather really trying to be catalytic in changing the way the federal government works internally as well as with the partners. So I think it's a really a breath of fresh air, and I wish you the greatest success, and I hope you have some partners in this room. Um, so thank you, Sonal, um, for those remarks. I'm now going to invite Bob Ross up and Fred and um, Diana, Carrie, and Karen, and Sonal too. And they're going to really sort of talk about what are the implications for the remarks that Sonal made. hear me? There we go. That's good. Okay. Well, thank you to, uh, uh, to you, Jim, um, and the center. Thank you for the leadership and bringing us all together. Thank you to, uh, to Jack um, and this wonderful uh, facility. This is great. I thought they only played basketball games here. I mean, who knew? <laughs> uh, I'm a little bit irritated that I see a full-service bar that's not open. <laughs> We can change that. <laughs> to us. Um, I guess maybe when Sono leaves, we'll open it up. <laughs> Jack's not smiling. Okay. <laughs> um, first of all, uh, Sono, that was uh, really a terrific, where are you? Terrific presentation. <laughs> and and uh, um, I, it's, I guess the summary is we're, I'm from the government and we're here to partner. Uh, and I think that that message was was well sent and, and, uh, and well received. Um, we've got a great uh, panel here to, uh, to dwell on some of the themes um, that, that Sonal uh, touched on. And, and to, to tee this up, um, I wanna, I wanna uh, 
delve on on uh, uh, some comments that, that Jim made um, earlier, just to, to set the context here uh, for the first question I'm going to throw out to the panel. I'll introduce them in a second. Uh, I think it was Jim mentioned that we're at a pretty extraordinary time, not just for our nation, but in our field. Uh, and on the one hand, we, we are continuing to weather um, a, a very stubborn and deep um, economic recession that uh, is leaving a lot of families and a lot of communities uh, in very deep pain. Uh, we have uh, community-based organizations, uh, nonprofit organizations that many of you support, many of us support, uh, that are limping and gasping and wheezing just to survive and make payroll. Okay? And you're having those conversations every day in your offices and with your grantees and with your boards and with your staff. And it's pretty rough out there and it's pretty ugly out there. At the same time, uh, we heard this extraordinary presentation, one that uh, uh, certainly I would not have imagined hearing from any White House official um, in, 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 my, in my lifespan or career span about a brand new day of openness to working with the sector to solve problems. Um, I too, uh, Jim, was, was impressed uh, with uh, Sonal's description of, of the office and its role not just managing and creating a $50 million social innovation fund, but in trying to, to uh, uh, get in the DNA of the White House and, and the federal agencies about what, what working differently means to solve problems. Um, and so therein lies tremendous amount of, of, of new ground for opportunity. And so here we are, managing that tension between uh, extraordinary uh, pain and discomfort felt by the communities that our mission serve and the organization serve, uh, and at the same time, uh, a tremendous amount of opportunity in the air. To, to, so we're going to we're going to dig deep with uh, with our panel here uh, to see how they're sorting through that uh, themselves as as professionals, but also the, the institutions they they represent. Uh, I'll give a a snapshot um, of. Uh, of, of who they are through the introduction, uh, but their bios are in your, in your packets. The only bio I'll read is my own. Um, <laughs> uh, the, uh, to my uh, far right is Karen Baker. And Karen was uh, appointed by Governor Schwarzenegger to serve as the first in the nation state cabinet secretary of service and volunteering um, in uh, February of 2008, uh, she brings a uh, strong experience in the exe executive director of California Volunteers and was also with the Clinton administration, uh, appointed by President Clinton as deputy director for AmeriCorps VISTA. So she brings national and state experience in volunteerism and service, and uh, we'll be hearing from her first up. Secondly, and to her left, uh, is Kerry Sullivan, and Kerry is the president of Bank of America Charitable Foundation. Um, she leads a team responsible of Bank of America for implementing a broad range of national programs associated with the company's corporate social responsibility uh, initiative and manages the bank's signature initiative, which is also known as the Neighborhood Excellence Initiative. Um, she's also from Massachusetts, but as she told me, don't blame her for what happened this past <laughs> week. Um, wasn't that a bumper sticker? <laughs> was that at the Nixon thing? Don't blame me. I'm from Massachusetts. So funny. Uh, next to, to of course, is, is Sonal Sean. We'll be hearing a Sonal. I'm going to turn to you for some remarks after, after our panelists weigh in. And to her left is a uh, good friend and colleague, Fred Ali. Uh, Fred is the uh, president and CEO of the Weingart Foundation. Uh, previously uh, was the uh, president and CEO of Covenant House. Um, also, it's interesting how Fred and I have been, have been friends for quite some time, and you get somebody's bio, and even though you've known the person for 10 or 20 years, you see stuff in the bio, you say, I didn't know that. Fred, I didn't know you were president of a community college. I was. Now, those of you who know Fred Ali would, would know why I'm wondering at that. I, Fred is a president of a college. But he's a wonderful guy. But, that, I just, but on the positive, Fred, um, <laughs> 
I didn't know that Fred began his career as a volunteer teacher and counselor in a small Eskimo village in Western Alaska in 1972. Um, so Fred, Fred Ali, welcome, yes. <laughs> And then uh, a person who uh, uh, comes to us also all the way from Washington, who is just an extraordinary leader uh, in our field and in the independent sector, uh, Diana Aviv, who's president and CEO of the independent sector, uh, the National Leadership Forum for America's Nonprofits, Foundations, and Corporate Giving Programs. Uh, she's a leading speaker on emerging trends within our sector, the financial state of the nonprofit uh, community, uh, public policies affecting charities. Uh, let me just say, folks, this woman represents us extremely well um, in Washington and is a real force, a, a dynamic force um, in the field of, of, uh, of philanthropy. And I was uh, thinking about you yesterday, uh, Diana, because I was reading uh, a book. You know, sometimes you, you read a book and then you see the movie. This time I saw the movie and then read the book, and that was the book Invictus. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, now, the, if you haven't seen the film, it's a must-see film, in my view, uh, about... Um, uh, Nelson Mandela era uh, as president uh, in, in South Africa and, and the book is even better in my view uh, but what's relevant for this conversation and a question I'm going to tee up for you guys um, as you weigh in I want you to think about it uh, Nelson Mandela uh, in the film and in the, and in the book ends up after uh, becoming uh, a newly elected president in doing something that he never thought he would ever do. And that is to endorse and get behind the South African national rugby team. Which uh, doesn't sound like a very big deal if you're not familiar with the, with the details of the story. But the South African national rugby team had become a symbolic uh, uh, institution for racism and apartheid in, in, in South Africa. And, and the movie and the book go through what was in Nelson Mandela's thinking as he uh, disappointed his, many of his followers in endorsing getting South Africa, even black South Africa, to, to get behind this team and cheer them on in, in, in the uh, international uh, rugby event. Um, and it's actually one of those rare, true movies. It has a very nice ending. Right? Um, but it certainly had me thinking in preparation for this, at the time that we're in, what are the kinds of the extraordinary times and, and, and things that you would never predict? What are the things that you think about doing that were previously either unlikely or even unimaginable? And I think we find ourselves in that kind of time where we need to rethink uh, and, and recalibrate everything that we've previously known because the times are so extraordinary. Um, so with that, and with so little pressure put on you to uh, <laughs> answer the questions, let me start with, uh, with Karen Baker. I've given them each uh, set about five to seven minutes to uh, just provide some comments. In this, uh, in this period of extraordinary uh, time for you, Karen, uh, yeah. volunteerism and service is now on the national discourse. And so what has it meant for you? Well, it's, it's been simply the most exciting time. Um, Service and volunteerism, obviously, we feel has always been around. I mean, how many of you have served on boards and been active in your community as volunteers, whether as a soccer mom or and active at your church? I mean, everyone's been doing it. Uh, but to have um, the President of the United States and the First Lady put such a bright light on it, to have our Governor Arnold Schwarzenegger and First Lady Maria Shriver put a bright light on it, to have local leaders with cities of service um, an investment from the Rockefeller Foundation, decide to invest in it. Suddenly, the new day is about um, we're, the fact that we're above the radar. It's not just this nice to do, or to, to quote Arnold, um, he'll say, it's more than just, you know, sweet ladies stuffing envelopes. You know, it's like, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and so, what does it really mean when you can do more than sweet ladies stuffing envelopes? Well, you can do so much. And what, what is exciting about this um, is that we're now, uh, thanks to uh, his leadership, we're at the cabinet table, one of 13 people sitting around a table. And when decisions are being discussed, public policy decisions are being discussed, and this is one of the points I want to make, um, suddenly the voice of the nonprofit field of everyday Californians, of foundations, this, this voice can be heard. Um, because when decisions are being made, either to release prisoners or to make certain cuts, 
um, there can be a hand in the room that goes, you know, excuse me, you know, I understand that you're thinking about that, but do you recognize that if we go in that direction, first of all, it might be helpful to get some of the players that are affected by this decision in the room, you know, and actually plan on how we might roll this out in a way that makes sense for our communities. And, and I can't tell you how many, how many times I've been just delighted to have both the governor and my fellow uh, cabinet members go, you know, great idea, we hadn't thought of that. Because you know, they're, they're so used to looking at their kind of bucket of state funds and going, well, the money runs out here, and the rest is up to the community to meet the need, meaning the foundations, the corporations, the nonprofits, the, the, the faith community. So, so suddenly to be at the table and looking at solutions together and incentives together, a lot of what Sonal touched on, is what is truly game changing. Um, now, what's a little bit challenging about this new game, it's good that we're above the radar, it's good that we're at the table, but I will let you know uh, what you already know, which is that our sector is not well organized. Uh, we don't have industry groups. We don't have um, an easy way for us to quickly get feedback on all of the players that are operating you know, in the energy space, in innovative environmental energy solutions, or quickly understand who are all the players in the, in the veterans arena if we want to quickly roll up a solution. Um, and, and so part of that is the information challenge, uh, you know, co connecting our communities more um, dynamically. And then, and then lastly, I will say, um, I really see a huge opportunity for foundations specifically to really look at investing in both public policy and volunteer coordination in a really dynamic way. Um, we need, and I, used to, I also used to run a nonprofit in LA called Chrysalis, um, a nonprofit um, that helps homeless people get jobs. I had 30 staff, and yet I never had a single person working on public policy. And I think back now uh, what missed opportunities there were to weigh in on decisions that were impacting the community I was there representing. Um, and I never even thought to ask for the money. And no foundation asked me if I was working on that. Um, also, in the volunteer coordination area, that happened to be an area we were really good at. And uh, there's some new studies that are going to be coming out by the TCC group, Peter York, that we'll put up on our website. It talks about how they have found that the most um, strong um, nonprofits are those that have shown themselves to effectively manage at least 50 volunteers or more because they, they know how to kind of use that human capital and manage it well. Um, what these wonderful leaders have done in shining a light on the fact that everyone can be involved and we want everyone to turn out is so great, but we have to prepare our nonprofits to use that resource effectively. What does that mean? It, be concrete it, about it means very explicitly, it means foundations looking at requests that come into them and saying, um, uh, I see here that you want to uh, have an impact with your program in this arena. Um, have you ever considered doing some of this body of work with highly skilled volunteers? Um, have, um, we'd be interested actually in helping to fund a volunteer coordinator. Do you have a whole volunteer culture? Um, how do you work in an innovative way with the private companies in your community? We want to better understand that because there's a lot of great energy and resource out there that you know, they're interested in being at the table. And, and how, are you, how are you leveraging that interest? And are you connected there? And kind of challenging the nonprofits to think about that. And I say that as someone who used to lead one. I was always surprised. Foundations never asked me that. They, they, they never kind of challenged me to think about the way I do my business. And that's. And, and now may be the perfect time, actually. I, to I think pose it's that like question. insanely yeah. perfect. No. Because these nonprofits are being, first of all, it, it, at times overwhelmed by all this civic energy and and you can be in a position where you say hey let's help you take advantage of this you know let's help move this in a really exciting direction you know and uh, we've got I know many there's many tools out there but californiavolunteers.org has a website where people can put up all their opportunities for the state of California we have over 50,000 opportunities listed so there's, there's all kinds of, of tools out, out there. There's ours, there's Volunteer Match, a lot of great folks out there. So I just, I just mention that because there's a lot more that the foundations can, I, in my view, can be doing to, 
to help organize this energy that our great leaders have galvanized. So one last question is, so yeah. to make it more concrete for our audience sure, in, a, in a room full of, of funders, yeah. what, what looks like a game changer for service and volunteerism in the state of California? What, what, what would exist tomorrow that doesn't exist today that um, would fundamentally change uh, volunteerism and service in terms of results um, for California? A special, okay, I think the creation of a specialized fund specifically dedicated in the state of California to bolster um, civic engagement so that nonprofits can use the great interest that is already out there and coming to their doors, whether it be in small grants, match grants, based on, you know, if someone is a doctor and is giving, you know, an hour of time, we'll give it a match. I don't, I don't know how it should work or, you know, an organization of a certain size, but, but I, think, I think the investment needs to be made. Yeah. Thank you, sure. uh, Karen. Carrie, the, the uh, your world has changed pretty significantly as well with, with Bank of America. You've, uh, yes, the corporate sector with... is not only uh, 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 dealing with a reasonable degree of, of, uh, of public and congressional scrutiny these days, but at the same time, you're also, well, you've got all kinds of reasons to be popular right now, right? From Massachusetts, and you're a Red Sox fan, which is a... Uh, and in, in Massachusetts. Um, but also, uh, the corporate sector is beginning to reassess its civic role. Um, talk about what that has meant for, for you and for Bank of America. Sure, sure. And I'm going to start from, I'm from Massachusetts, and I work for a bank. So I just want to start from that <laughs> threshold. <laughs> but um, I, I think, um, first of all, the, the current downturn in the economy that's really started at the end of 2008 has really impacted our thinking and how we approach philanthropy and volunteerism. And I would say, um, first and foremost, um, it really has crystallized you know, where we should be and what we should do. Um, and I say that because we have really um, tweaked and changed some of the way we approach philanthropy. Um, first of all, we, you know, it's part of our um, corporate DNA. It's part of our corporate social responsibility. So we believe that by you know, supporting communities, the health of communities, um, both through you know, philanthropic grants and volunteerism, is, is not only the right thing to do, it's good for our business. I mean, I think we've learned that um, when things aren't going well in the community, things aren't going well for the bank. So it's sort of, it's sort of in our strategy, and it's something that we take seriously. And in fact, um, in 2009, at really the height of, um, of, of the downturn, we really began, uh, uh, commenced on a goal of giving away $2 billion over 10 years. And I think some people said, gee, they must be crazy. <laughs> look, at, look what's going on in banking. But we really believe that the health of our community was very important to us. So we did, we did stay on that path. And, and um, we have um, you know, worked at the community level and funded across a broad array of community needs. So we fund, we're not known for one type of grant. We, you know, we fund in community development, health and human services, arts and culture. Um, and education, and those those are really a, the hallmark. You know, we fund around community needs. We also, I think, this past year have have listened more to what communities need from us. So um, we're really spending a lot of time convening um, uh, with community groups, talking to other funders. I think right now, um, in fact, we were just in a, a meeting um, at the bank. Collaboration is really key for us. We know we can't do it alone. Um, and that's why like, the Social Innovation Fund is, is great for us because it f finds a way for us to work with you know, other funders, bigger thinkers, and for us to really play a, a significant role um, in changing communities. Um, the piece that I think we've really centered on in this past year is continuing to fund general operating support. I mean, we've always been a general operating funder. And what we really are, are, are attempting to do is, is strengthen the sector that is so um, beat up from, from particularly in the health and human services from decreased funding and increased demand. So along those lines, we've really focused on um, sort of a safety net initiative, and we're funding, you know, first and foremost, um, those things that um, people most need, whether it's, you know, feeding programs, shelter programs, transitional work programs, child care programs, and other health, community health programs. We're funding those, but we're also looking to sort of the longer term solutions. So. We're looking to collaborate. We're looking to find ways um, 
um, to uh, participate in some of the federal programs that are coming down and working with other, other corporations and foundations. I think with respect to volunteerism, um, because of a corporate foundation, we always think you know, rather than give dollars, we give of ourselves. We have 300,000 employees. And we've spent the last year um, really rethinking how we approach volunteerism. And I think the piece that um, we, we started, we have a great program, but we allowed employees to just follow their passion, you know, do the PTA, you know, do, get involved. But now we're really rethinking that and say, gee, all of this good work that folks are doing should be focused more on our own philanthropy and our own um, CSR programs. So we've spent the last year really sort of working to build programs that will have more impact in communities. I mean, there's a, obviously a, a huge um, you know, call to service in the nation and the need for people to get involved. And people really do want to get involved. Um, so we're, we've spent a long time re-engineering that so it has more impact and bringing some of our skills. Um, for instance, we've um, ventured on a, a program with uh, Feeding America and, and one of the things that we want our associates to get involved with is getting folks, um, folks that come to food pantries signing up for um, SNAP programs or food stamps. So we're really trying to think what is the, you know, what is the mission of the organization? How can our volunteers contribute to that mission? Um, so those are the things that, that we've, we've focused on a lot. And I, and I will say the other piece that um, our, our Neighborhood Excellence Initiative, which is our uh, really our hallmark um, program has been in existence for the past six years and it is about creating the next generation of leadership whether it's the nonprofit leaders or young people coming along and wanting to get involved in service and you know that whole grant program does give general operating support and, and an interesting piece of that program this past year the recipients across all of our markets in 45 markets across the con country um, 70% of those recipients were what I would call safety net organizations. So it's a program that I think is relevant and, and speaks to the needs that, that we're hearing in the community. Um, but I think if, if I were to leave with three things is we, we try to listen to what communities need. We try to work collaboratively with other funders and look to see where there are gaps. Um, so those are the, those are, it's been a terrifying year in many respects for the bank, but I think it's crystallized and given us more direction on how we can you know, better serve our communities and, and enhance our business. So. So more listening, convening, collaboration. I'm interested in, in knowing, Kerry, whether, whether with the public and congressional scrutiny and in criticism of financial institutions and, and generally and, and banks specifically, um, do you, are you guys feeling more pressure to either give more or be more strategic with your giving? How has that spilled over into the work that you do? Well, I mean, I think that's a good co question. I think we held our course, so I think, you know, you know, we, we sort of tied it into our business strategy, so I don't think we feel pressure to do more. I think we feel pressure to get it right and to, and to really have impact. So um, along those lines, I think we realize we can't go alone in programs, that it's, it's, it's working with a broader group of funders, convening thinkers so that we're, 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 our grant dollars will make a difference. Um, Fred Ali. Fred, I'm going to have to say something nice about you since I <laughs> made fun of you earlier. Um, but I will say it's, it's, uh, it's meant to be true. And I know um, Fred will, will uh, at least some of his comments, will, will be focused in this direction. Uh, all of us like to talk about how the organizations we serve, the mission we serve, the grantees we serve are most important. They're first and foremost. We all are trained to talk like that and then some of us do it better than others. Uh, and I will say in the time I've known Fred, um, every conversation we have about philanthropy, uh, Fred talks about the grantees and the nonprofits first. Um, and so uh, I know, Fred, because we've had these kind of conversations, uh, you are deeply concerned about what's happening to the sector right now, uh, both in terms of its capacity, its readiness, and even its survivability. So talk about what, um, what worries you most and what, if anything, are you potentially excited about? So, yeah, thanks, Bob. Um, uh, I am very, very concerned. Uh, I, I've been working in this field for about 35 years, and I don't think I've ever seen it quite this bad. Um, uh, it's, it's, it's very tough for nonprofit organizations right now. Um, somebody asked me uh, earlier today what I thought about the overall capacity of the sector right now, nonprofit organizations. And I said, you know, I, I don't think I've ever seen it quite this challenged. Now, now having said that, um, 
I want to start off by saying that over the last 12 months or so, um, I have seen um, incredibly smart, uh, tough decision making on the part of a lot of nonprofit leaders. I have at times described some of the things we've seen as to our board is almost heroic, the things that people have done so committed to their mission um, to, keep, uh, to keep programs alive. So it's been, it's, from that standpoint, it's been very inspiring. Um, on the other hand, um, being very candid, we have also seen a number of organizations that we work with, and I'm sure many people here can, can repeat a similar story, who um, really f did not take immediate action. Uh, the hope was maybe the economic downturn was not as deep, would not go as long as it has, and now those organizations um, find themselves in very, very serious trouble. So, so it's a bit of a mixed bag when you, when you look at the capacity of the, uh, of the sector, at least from our standpoint. A lot of my comments are based on a decision that our foundation made about 12, 12 months ago you know, we, we're a responsive grant maker, as many of you know. Uh, we fund in the area of health education and human services. Our focus is on low-income, uh, is, is low underserved communities. So we looked out over the sector and realized that we were in the midst of a crisis. Um, this thing that um, people are now referring to as the new normal um, certainly was, was upon us. And so we decided, despite sort of losses in our own financial portfolio, we decided that we were going to maintain a relatively high grant, grant budget because this seemed to be the time to do that. But more importantly, we were going to suspend our normal grant making and focus our grant dollars on providing unrestricted grants to important, critical, primarily initially safety, bet, safety net organizations within the community. We also decided that we needed to take a better look at what we were doing in the area of capacity building. We've been funding in that area for a long time, but our sense was we could be doing better in that area. And we, we, did, we focused on capacity building because sort of given our experience in the sector, you know what happens in times like this in the short term Nonprofits always cut infrastructure first. It's in our DNA not to go after those programs. You know, we do everything to preserve the programs. They do everything to, pro to, to preserve the programs, and so they cut infrastructure, oftentimes to their short-term and long-term detriment. The other thing is... is so before you leave that point, because, yeah. you, you know, philanthropy can have week-long conferences just on defining capacity building. Right. But can you give us <laughs> give us the wine so How much time do we have? <laughs> so I'm going to I'm going to give you a very simple definition. When when we think of capacity building, we think of strengthening an organization to better perform its mission. Very very simply, and in our in our experience, the best way to sort of do capacity building is through, through a very good thorough analysis. Uh, an honest sort of organizational assessment that might lead you in the area of strengthening program, it might lead you in the area of stre strengthening infrastructure. How'd I do? Okay. That's pretty good. All right. So, um, before I was rudely interrupted <laughs> by my friend, um, the, the point I wanted to make is in the long term, uh, what we also thought would happen, and in fact appears to have happened, is that organizations, again, to sort of preserve program, do everything they can to preserve program, would start going into their reserves and would run through their line of credit. And, you know, I think it was the Nonprofit Finance Fund that in the fall of this year did a survey of nonprofit organizations, found that 62, this was in the fall, 62% of charities have less than three months operating reserve, and 16% of the surveys for the organizations they, they surveyed um, um, were expected to have serious difficulties paying expenses in the upcoming year. So, uh, and that was in the fall. A lot has happened since that time. So, I guess 
what we have seen in summary, um, and we have received, once we made this announcement, by the way, that we were going to focus on, on core support, you can imagine, um, we became very, very busy, um, as, you, as you can imagine. And so, you know, I might end just by providing a snapshot of what we have seen, sort of through the lens of the, the many letters of inquiry that our grant, grant staff has had to review. And all of this is, all of this will not come as a surprise to anyone in the room, but I think it's important, especially now when we're gathered together, to think about these things. Because I think, ultimately, my point is, is that philanthropy's got to respond to this. And maybe if it means stopping some things we've done in the past in order to respond to an emergent situation, I think that's something that needs consideration. But, but anyway. Um, all the organizations that are coming to us are, of course, reporting significantly increased, uh, increased service demand. Obviously, they're reporting deep drops in public, public and private support. They're, um, they're impacted seriously by delays in, in government reimbursements, fee-for-service contracts. Uh, and we may be headed in that direction again in the very near future. Um, they, and now, very, very frequently, we're seeing organizations reporting to us that they've done, they've done all the easy stuff, and now they're having to, um, to reduce core programs, which is really devastating. Again, if you think that most of our, most of our work is being done in communities that can't really afford uh, reductions in, in core programs and services. So if you, and now we overlay that, one final comment on um, a very, very deep state budget crisis that, at least in my judgment, I think in the judgment of a lot of people here, is going to disproportionately impact people in the safety net. Um, those are the people who are going to be impacted by this. So, so I, I think that the discussion about, um, about innovation that leads to greater impact and better outcomes is absolutely critical, and we need to be having that discussion. But I also think we need to be ha keeping, our, keeping our eye on the fact that organizations need our help at this particular point in time, and we need to respond to that. Fred, let me pose to you. I'm, I'm uh, reminded, as my staff knows, I can't get through a discussion without a, <laughs> invoking a sports metaphor. So um, Vince Lombardi, who was considered one of the greatest football coaches of all time and won so many championships and Super Bowls, was once asked by a reporter, um, what's the secret to your coaching success of winning so many championships? And, and Vince Lombardi paused and said, well, we learned to block and tackle better than the other guy, <laughs> which is a way of saying we just, we just do the fundamentals, not the sexy stuff, better than, the other, uh, than everybody else. And so it sounds like you're describing you're making a case for describing organizational capacity building and core operating support as the blocking and tackling of what we do in our field. Through that lens, um, same question I, I posed to Karen. Uh, if you was R and you could choreograph or create a game-changing um, approach to the issue of capacity in the nonprofit sector, what would that look like? That's different than what we're doing now. Yeah. Um, I, I would say, first of all, um, in speaking uh, to funders, um, I think that uh, now more than ever, um, good organizations with good leadership need unrestricted dollars to deploy as they see best. Um, anyone who's run a nonprofit organization knows that that is critically important. And some people, and I happen to be one of these individuals, think that unrestricted support is one of the best ways to build capacity. So that's number one. Number two is we, and most funders do this, but I'm going to mention it anyway. We need to provide, pay for the full cost of programs we support and quit starving the sector. We become part of the problem um, by, by somehow ignoring administrative costs. Um, uh, these programs cost money. Organizations need to be, receive full support. So, so that's the second thing. 
that I, that I think is, is, is very, very important. And, and then I think the third thing that we need to do is we need to get our voice involved somehow in this argument. And for many of you, hearing a president of the Weingart Foundation suggest that we need to become more active in the area of public policy may come as a bit of a surprise. But I was a little bit, you know, I was a little bit taken back last year, maybe to add some, be a little provocative here, that organizations, nonprofit organizations were getting kicked in the teeth um, dealing with IOUs and delayed government reimbursements. And I didn't hear enough people from our sector really rising up and saying that is unacceptable behavior. That cannot stand. These are critical organizations. And without that advocacy, the capacity of the sector will continue to decline. So I'll stop there. Fred, spoken with the eloquence of a, of a college president. <laughs> <laughs> Diana Aviv is uh, the person probably with the best bird's eye view um, of our sector. Uh, she is a hands-on uh, independent sector executive and uh, and also someone who uh, if you don't know read her bio she's a she's a native South African and knows a little something about about uh, authentic and meaningful social change and so uh, really quite an extraordinary time uh, for all of us and you uh, Diana simple question what keeps you awake at night worried and what gets you excited you know Bob I wasn't surprised that you started your comments with the uh invoking Nelson Mandela and Invictus, uh, because in some ways we're living in counterintuitive times, and what he did was counterintuitive. And uh, it also feels to me that uh, when we're in a skid, the automatic response when you're driving a car and you're in a skid is to move away from the direction of the catastrophe. And in fact, the way you need to drive out of that skid is right towards it and then steer and control. And I think that the great challenge for nonprofit organizations right now and for foundations is how do you drive into that skid well enough that you can take control and move in a different direction. So, so that's the first thing. What does a South African know about driving in the snow? <laughs> Not much. <laughs> Let me tell you. On the other hand. <laughs> Rudely interrupted. Um, before you rudely interrupt me again, let me get quickly get to that. <laughs> um, the, the second thing that I want to say, I was saying this to Fred earlier. We were talking and lamenting about the crisis and making sure that we don't jump to solutions and not recognize that we're living in a reality right now that is profoundly different than what it was two years ago. And we're not likely to go back to the past in the future anytime soon. And so that to say that we need to reinvent ourselves if we're going to solve any problems is to recognize that we shouldn't be waiting until maybe it's all going to be fine again and then we can go back to doing what we're doing. And if we hold our nose underwater long enough and drive away from that skid, that somehow these problems are going to be solved. We have to recognize that we're living in different times. What comes to mind to me is that lots of people in the sector have been doing what Elizabeth Kubler-Ross described in the process of dying, which is first beginning with denial, then being, firstly beginning with anger, then denial, then bargaining, then depression, and finally acceptance. And when we get to the stage of recognizing that what we've lost, what has been, is never going to be, then folks can get to the stage where they start saying, what we have is in front of us, what do we need to do, and where do we go, and how do we get there? And that the new normal, or the current normal, is completely different from what it was, and we have to change and reinvent the way in which we think about ourselves and our work. And when organizations do that, I think that they've got a fighting chance of succeeding. And even if the demand and the need is much greater than their capacity, within the context of their capacity, what is it possible to do? And so what I see at the national level, looking at many different organizations, some national, some regional, some local, is that the ones that are succeeding are the ones who have moved through the Kubler-Ross stages and are thinking about 
how to frame today in a different kind of way. Go to other countries around the world and they look at the trillion dollars that this sector spends every year on the work that we do and they say, you've got a heck of a lot of money. We wish we had, you ha we had 10% of what you spend for what we would want to do. If only we had that. Whereas we're looking at what we lost. And when we stop looking at what we lost and what we need to do, then I think we get to a different, um, to a different place. Um, having said that, uh, let me say that some of the things that we've seen at the national level, or at least from where I sit, that are different than in the past, and I really mean this, I'm, I'm actually quite surprised, is that people are collaborating in a way that they didn't before. You see, the model in our sector has not encouraged real serious collaboration. Because in order to get funding, organizations had to describe how they were uniquely and distinctly different from the other organization, so that that's why the funder, whether it was an individual donor, whether it was government, or whether it was a foundation, would fund them because they were different from the other. Well, if I'm spending all of my time describing how I'm different from anybody else, and then you come to me and say, well, now you need to collaborate, when I've done everything in my power to show how we're different, it's not so easy to collaborate. Now, because there's less money, and because if I don't collaborate, because I simply don't have the capacity to do all the things that I've done before, if I work with you, maybe we can get through something, we're finding that there are new forms of collaboration that we've never seen before. That is born out of absolute dire necessity. And I would say to foundations who don't like to say that you do social engineering, my members, I say to you that you do social engineering all the time by deciding what it is that you support versus what it is that you don't support. So why not support collaboration and encourage that kind of work so that people can actually get to work together and move to a whole different level of interacting where they understand how they really are part of a social ecosystem and that they're not separate, isolated entities moving and spinning in spaces that don't work. Another thing that we're seeing, and I think this is one that we really need to take a look at, uh, and we'll only know the, the answer to this in about six months' time. The sector has been growing at almost twice the rate of the business sector. Uh, we, we've doubled ourselves in the last 15 years. Uh, in the last number of years, there have been about 70,000 new nonprofits being formed each year. We'll see whether that's been true more recently. But as we think about what it is that we do differently to support innovative ideas, Sonal and I have had this discussion many times, we need to be careful that we don't produce outcomes that generate a whole bunch of new nonprofits that in the first two years have a little money and then spend the rest of their time in search of money as the existing organizations compete with them. That somehow we need to find a way to work also with existing structures, helping them reinvent themselves, partly by giving the kind of money that enables them to do it and partly by creating the kind of collaborative partnerships that I was talking about before that bring in new folks into existing institutions and encouraging those existing institutions to work in a new and a different way and to stop lamenting the past. So I think that those are just a couple of the things that I'm thinking about and seeing at the national level. Just last thing I want to say about our work um, in Washington. Uh, there's good and bad news here. Uh, I must say that working in Washington this past year has probably been more interesting to me than in a long time because we have folks like Sonal who not only know and understand our sector, uh, she's not the only one, there are lots of folks um, in the White House who've come from the sector, but because there's a genuine interest in partnering with us in a different kind of a way. Not simply saying to foundations, come on down folks, and we can do this, would you just fund the rest of it? You know, I've heard a cabinet secretary after cabinet secretary say, we have much more money than you do, but you can do things that we can't. You can do the innovation, you can do all those kinds of things. But having said that, while they're in the White House, the imperatives and the crises and the priorities that they face are now different. Their responsibilities are different. And we need to remember that we have responsibilities and we have a point of view that's different. And so as we come to these conversations, we actually come from different perspectives. And we need to hold the White House accountable. There are folks in the White House who tell me all the time that there are very few people in the White House talking about the nonprofit sector. Very few. 
And where are we and where is our voice making sure that we hold their feet to the fire? I am sure the Chamber of Commerce is not making that mistake. I'm sure that there are lots of businesses not making that mistake. Well, what are we doing? We're working in our little silos, and we're so pleased to be able to work with this department and that department. We're not working together. And the other side of that, I want to say, go to the other side of Pennsylvania Avenue, and what a mess. The, when we say that there's gridlock there, I've, I don't think I've ever seen anything like this. It's warfare. It's absolute warfare. I think it's terrible that the Democrats and the Republicans, you know, Sonal, you described earlier the, the, the legislation that passed in, in five weeks. Boy, was that quick. I don't think if that legislation was on the table now it would pass. The atmosphere has changed. It's been poisoned. And we who are conscious about public policy, who recognize this, are sitting and clucking and saying, isn't this terrible? Well, you know what? We shouldn't accept this. And we need to make sure that lawmakers on both sides of the aisle are there and are talking about solutions just as we're talking about solutions. And we need to engage with them in a way in which that's part of the discussion. And I see us missing in action. So those are just a few thoughts that I have. <laughs> you shouldn't beat around the bush, Diana. <laughs> Tell us what you really think. Um, Fred, bar. please. Bar. Oh. Oh. Now you all need a drink. Oh, the bar, yeah. Oh, the bar's open. Thank you, Jack. I no no rush person. to the bar, please. Uh, Sonal, re reactions to, to what you've heard, um, insights, uh, clarifications. Um, Diana's uh, uh, rather uh, provocative assessment of what's going on and what, what needs to happen. Um, so let me just start with Diana. I, right on. <laughs> uh, you know, and, and, and I think this is probably a bit of what I was trying to say at the end, which is we need information and we need colleagues that are, we can do our part, but you need to do your part. And I, I'm sure Karen would say the same. I can sit at the table and, and say we need more pro policies for nonprofits, but if the nonprofits aren't at the table saying they need more policies for themselves, or the philanthropy is not at the table saying we need better policies, we're fighting an uphill battle. And every single day the battle is, uh, we gotta get jobs, we've gotta get more jobs, um, we've gotta get the economy on track, and the nonprofits are part of that economy, and the, the, the sector is a part of that economy. If we don't make a case for it, uh, it will not be at the table. So we're, we're gonna do our part, but you do need to do, you do, need to do your part. Um, and that, that, that part, I think, is, is, is right on, and I, you know, I encourage you to continue to hold us accountable. I encourage you to push us further. I encourage you to do more of it. That is, that is the job of the civic, that is civic engagement. If we believe in civic engagement, we also believe in the fact that we need, to, we need the engagement um, and to push us on engagement too. Um, Can I comment on that in that, like I'll just say in California, there's 140,000 nonprofits, okay? The California Association of Nonprofits, CAN, which represents the sector, has a staff of one, okay? This, to me, is not a powerhouse lobby operation, <laughs> you know? <laughs> and it just speaks to the point that I think they're making, that um, that, to me, is really challenging when we want to go in and make a point about how it's not okay to take dollars from really critical missions that, that that communities are trying to meet. And uh, it's just a small example. Another big idea is let's bolster that. Let's really get that organized. But uh, Diana, let me, let, me, let me ask you to uh, be direct about another, another point. And that is, we criticize ourselves and others criticize us. And I'm talking now more specifically the, the philanthropic part of the independent sector. Uh, for being risk averse and not being risky enough. Can you just tick off two or three specific concrete areas where you would love to see philanthropic leaders step up to the, to the plate in terms of risk? Well, that would make a difference. One that will make a difference, and I'm not even sure that this is even risky, but uh, that I think would produce a huge outcome. So I want to talk, I want to say that, that in the end, 
one of the positives that's coming out of this really bad moment in time from an economic perspective mm -hmm. is that people are increasingly focusing on impact and beginning to recognize that if they don't focus on outcomes and demonstrate outcomes, that there's a very good chance that they're not going to succeed. Believing in it is lovely, but it ain't good enough any longer. You know, just because you've got the right thoughts and you dream these great ideas just isn't good enough. Uh, one of the th problems that I face every week in Washington, whether it's Sonal calling me or a thousand other folks on, on, in Congress, on the Republican side, on the Democratic side, or departments in Washington, is can you give us data on such and such? There's a discussion going on, and we call around to all the academic institutions, and we don't have the data. There are all kinds of instruments. It's, it's the point that, that, that you're yeah, making. That's right. That, that uh, there are, so it's not, and your point was that you don't even sometimes know who to call because Absolutely. those infrastructures aren't in place. Right. Actually, I, I took a quick look at Flow Green, and we know that the, some of those, in, and, some and issues Sushma, are. The, right, right, the, right. There, are, there are some of those institutions, but even they don't necessarily have the kind of data that is not anecdotal. Yeah. And that if we're going to make policy by anecdote, we're in very deep trouble. So one of the ways to step up, and it's not so sexy, is to make sure that the kinds of questions that are, that are being asked, we can answer in serious ways. So, so that would be the first one. The second one is that uh, foundations know that, that you can't fund lobbying and that the only kind of lobbying that you can engage in yourself within the framework of the current law is uh, self-defense kinds of lobbying. Uh, but we find that uh, lots of folks in the foundation world stay away from this altogether because it's controversial. I, you know, I thought the First Amendment said that we have the right to peaceably assemble and to petition government for the redress of grievances. I'm South African. That was what I had to say in order to get my oath and all that. <laughs> so I think that we have a responsibility to support educating lawmakers and moving in that direction. So don't only fund folks to do that. Go on those trips and see what happens. Get the kind of education that Fred got so that even Fred is now thinking that this is important to do. That's the sort of thing that really matters. You, even and Fred. last thing, Bob, you're <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. The former I'll sit back in a minute. Bob, you're a perfect example. Right. You and I were joking about this a little earlier. You come to Washington, you, you get racking up a lot of frequent flyer miles because you're in Washington all the time. It's hard to be here and but have I'm to go lobbying. there all the time. No, but you, but you are invited to talk. At the in, and, at the, and you know at the invitation of Congress, you actually legally are allowed to come and share. And you're invited and you go. It does mean making the effort. But people need to hear from you. I think that within the foundation universe are some of the best experts in the country. You steal them all the time from the nonprofits. Share that expertise with people on Capitol Hill so that they make the right decisions. So I'm going to make one other comment and then, and then we're going to open it up. Right, Jim? Is that okay? Uh, so if you have questions... Uh, are there folks out there with mics? One there? And, okay, so uh, get ready for your question. So he, here's what, um, what I'm hearing you say, uh, uh, Diana. Um, I, I'm actually going to kick this up to another level of pressure on this sector, which is um, the, the, the distrust, cynicism, and skepticism about government's ability and capacity to solve problems is at, a, is at an all-time high. Um, it's certainly true in California. It's certainly true in Washington. Um, certainly probably contributed to, um, to uh, the Massachusetts uh, in some manner, way, shape, or form. I'm sure there's an element of, of, of that vote in there somewhere. I think I'm hearing you say um, not only do we need to to step up our leadership role, but that there is a role for the sector in providing the leadership to reinfuse a sense of hope, not naive hope, but real hope that results can be achieved, problems are capable of being solved, and, and cut out the, the bipartisan and partisan bickering because it, it, is, it is our sector that is figuring out the way that these problems actually can meaningfully be solved. And if we have better data, better communication strategy, 
um, better positioning in the public discourse. I think what I hear you calling for is not your granddaddy's nonprofit sector, the polite charity sector that, that and I don't mean, mean this pejoratively, that hands out sandwiches and, 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 and serves coffee during a disaster, but is actually an authentic problem-solving, results-driving institution that also uses innovation to solve problems. I mean, is that, you're, you're yes. asking us to step up to that plate and, and, and realize and that that's I a, do, an but And I want to give you one, just one tiny example that, that, and in this particular case, I'm going to actually share the name. That when earlier in the year, we went to uh, Senator Grassley, who's Republican from, from Iowa, to talk to him about supporting a particular initiative that, uh, that uh, was part of the uh, conversation that was going on on, um, on Capitol Hill. And he said to us, or his team said to us, don't talk to me, don't talk to us, because the Democrats aren't going to take any amendments from me. Um, you really have to talk to the Democrats. So we then went to the Democrats and we said, we think you should do this. What we didn't do, and I regret it every day that I didn't do it, is to say that's not acceptable. We should have gone to the Democrats and said, who, who did it and liked the idea. That, but it was, it was Senator Grassley's idea to begin with. And we said, won't you move your idea forward? And it had to do this with bridge loans, mm -hmm. actually, mm -hmm. uh, the, the issue that, that, that you were talking about, something that was a nonpartisan issue. How do we make sure that states hold up their responsibilities to pay the contracts to health and human service organizations? But the very idea that the lawmakers are not going to even work together is something that, as we're talking, we shouldn't work so narrowly in our silos that if we can't get it this way, then we'll get it that way, because our job's to get that done. But to also say, what kind of democracy do we have? How do we hold our public officials accountable for working together to do the people's business? That's what I'm talking about. Uh, with that, questions, comments? Far away. Oh, thank you. Um, to any member of our panel. Uh, well, maybe this is to all of you. My name is Flo Green, and I'm the recently retired executive director of the California Association of Nonprofits, which used to have a staff of 14. Um, and I'm going to use a sports metaphor so that it helps here. It sort of feels like the conversation is like a Yogi Berra quote that when you come to a cross in the road, take it. And that what we're proposing, a lot of what you're proposing that we do is really an administrative function. Guess what we can't get money for? Administrative processes. And so how do we find a way to address the issues when in fact we can't get funding for the very thing you're talking about? Sometimes because the law says you can't fund public, that foundations can't fund public policy work most of which is really educational. I also want to say that there's in fact a lot going on that isn't being seen. Nonprofits are working with legislators every day to write policy. But it, clearly it isn't being seen if we're saying it isn't there. So how do we get our, the work that we're doing to be seen better? How do we get the administrative money that we need in order to in fact address these issues that you're bringing up? I don't mind. I, let me just take it from one perspective, and and I actually think um, capacity building and growth capital, and and you know, having worked in a uh, having worked in two companies, and then having worked in uh, a philanthropy, just to think, we take we fully take for granted the infrastructure that exists. Mm -hmm. We take for granted that the computers work, and that they're up to date. We take for granted that the telephones work and that we can make international phone calls. Uh, we take for granted that all of these things exist, and because the infrastructure is there, we can do our jobs better. Yet, when it comes to the nonprofits, we don't want to pay for any of that. And I say that having run one. Um, and putting up my own money to buy an tele international telephone card so I can make a call. Putting up my own capital and buying my own computer so I can ha make sure that the staff has the, you know, the up-to-date software. All of that costs money, and one of the things that I think we forget about with the nonprofit sector is, and what Fred, you said, is that they will cut and they will not buy all of those things because they want to provide the services. So the assumption that we make that they won't do it is the wrong assumption. And 
And that assumption is a fascinating one. The government does the same thing, and this is where we've been trying to think about this, that the assumption that someone won't invest in good people, and we look at the nonprofit sector, government sector, we're going to lose a lot of people in the next 10 years. Where is that leadership going to go? Because all of those young people are moving to companies to go do corporate philanthropy programs because they can't get paid. Yet we don't want to invest in, the, in good pay or training. I worked in a company where we spent a lot of money, two companies where we spent a lot of money training the up and coming leaders to have the skill sets to be leaders in the sector. But you can't do that in the nonprofit sector because that's considered overhead. So can companies step up to the table and offer some of that training? Can philanthropy think about aggregated training sessions for nonprofits? You know, it doesn't mean you have to give it to every individual nonprofit, but can we be creative about those solutions? Because it's not fair to the sector that the burden falls on them to provide the service, to, to pay for the infrastructure, and at the same time increase their capacity to do policy making and to do other things. The second point on policy making, I can't tell you enough how many nonprofits do actually go to policymakers and are part of the legislative process, but they're individuals. There is no aggregated response of, and I call, and Diana hears from me all the time, at least once a week I send her an urgent message that I need some data on something because we need to make a case for it or somebody's putting a bill up and we need to have a case to be made. And that information is still so not aggregated. One, one group, when some, what happens with congressional um, staff, and to be fair to them, there's not many of them. You know, there's five people working in an office trying to write the bill. Mm -hmm. uh, they're trying to do their job. But so they call the person that they know in their community who can help them write that. And maybe they get to Diana, or maybe they get to a nonprofit that works in the state that they're from, and they get some information. Whether that's good information or bad information, they don't have time to, to go through it, they just say, okay, I got this information from a source who I thought was credible, and then they write that up, and that becomes legislation, which we all have to live with. So it, it is just to say, invest in, the, invest in the resource of information and invest in the resource of aggregated information that we can make smarter decisions on. And I, I, can't, speak high, I, I can't speak enough of saying why we should fund capacity building and to do it well, not just fund capacity building, but actually invest in that leadership and that, that capacity to, to address that. So, yeah, Fred? Bob, yeah. I just want, I want to pick up on that. Um, actually, something that, that Diana said, and so I'm going to start off kind here, and I'm going to say that <laughs> in my game-changing game changing answer, I, I should have also mentioned that, um, I've, and this is, part of this is my hat with the Southern California grant makers, but now is not the time, at least in my opinion, for funders to start pulling back and supporting the infrastructure organizations in the sector, organizations like the independent sector. And my two friends up here from Northern California grant makers and Southern California grant makers, but that, that becomes a forum for discussion and collaboration among funders and searching for new ideas. So I, I think that's important. But I want to come back just to two things. We're talking now about the need for better data, better outcome data. Proving cause and effect has always been really difficult in our sector. So I think we just have to realize that. And we also have to realize that it costs money to do this. So if I'm a nonprofit organization and I'm listening to this, this is just something else I put on my list about where's the money for that coming from because it's very, very important. So we're not going to solve that problem real quickly. But I, we, if we're serious about this, and I, I take your point, we have, to, we have to be willing to invest in it. And funders generally have not invested a lot of money. In this. Right, I'm going to turn to Kerry, but, but moderator's prerogative here, um, and, a, and, a, and a constructive, hopefully, yeah. pushback. As many of you have presented grants to your own boards, mm -hmm. the fastest way to kill enthusiasm for a grant in a very tough and unrelenting and an unforgiving environment is to mention infrastructure mm -hmm. right now. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's, it, is, it, is, it, is not, um, it is not sexy, it is not popular, and, and there's also a reasonable case from the standpoint of a board member and a trustee who has a fiduciary responsibility for these funds when they're seeing the devastation in Haiti, when they're seeing the devastation in the neighborhoods, they say, wait a minute, why am I giving $50,000 to that infrastructure group when it should be going to this, to this, to this food bank. Now, my two cents on that is that uh, we do a lousy job of describing infrastructure investment to what end, mm -hmm. to what purpose. 
And so if the infrastructure investment is to the elimination of poverty, to the improvement of, of, of equity, to, to dropping the, the, uh, the high school dropout rate by 50 percent, now the infrastructure has a reason for being rather than this distant, bureaucratically, administratively encumbered sounding infrastructure. So I think, I think we all do need to do a better job from us to, to, to our friends here from SCG and NCG, to you, Fred, of saying infrastructure for what higher purpose and link it directly to our missions rather than um, some far off um, uh, administrative uh, cost overhead. So that, that's my two cents. Kerry. Right, and, and I, I was actually going to speak something um, along those lines because I'm going to defend corporate America here in a, in a little bit, but we actually do fund general operating support, and it is mission-driven. I mean, if, if we believe that we need to be solving um, issues around um, affordable housing or, or feeding programs or child care programs, if we believe in that agency's mission, we do give it unrestricted operating support. So we veer off giving just program support. So that, in, in its very nature, mm -hmm. covers overhead, the computers, the phone, the fax, and all of those things. And the other thing that we've been doing, and I think it's becoming a more important part of what we bring to communities and to the nonprofits, is really working with some um, technical assistance providers, like the Bridge Spans, like the Nonprofit Finance Fund, really bringing you know, important trainings and lessons that they can learn. But what we find is when we bring people and convene in the room, Nonprofits learn from each other because I think the cross pollination of ideas um, is really important. So, I mean, the strength of that sector and the intellectual capital in that sector can be leveraged between, you know, between those agencies because I think that's an, an important thing. I know when, I, when you go to a philanthropy conference and talk to other foundations, you take home lots of great learnings. But really, convening nonprofits, I think, is an important role and one that has very low cost but high impact. I mean, just really convening those folks. So a lot of the infrastructure organizations that support and bring together, um, you know, whether it's a group like the independent section, the regional associations of grant makers, those forums are really powerful. And, glue, I, and I think we can under, I yeah. don't think we can underestimate um, the value of that. Uh, question. Uh, yes. Excuse me. Um, Shirley, how are you? <clears throat> yes. Last week, the Supreme Court handed down the decision uh, regarding free speech that corporations could spend unlimited funds on advocacy. Could you tell us if that uh, decision affects nonprofits, and if so, what the implications are? Can, yeah, can we start lobbying now? <laughs> no, firstly, we are 501c3. So if you elect to have a 501c3 status, the law uh, doesn't allow you to engage in partisan political activity. And the Supreme Court did not comment on 501c3s. That wasn't part of the discussion. What that therefore means is that uh, the corporate sector has given even more capacity and more muscle to be able to do what they've always been doing. The difference is that they won't have to do it through um, the, the political facts. action committees and separate it out so that the transparency of what they do will be further obfuscated. So it will be more difficult for the public to know what part of the corporate, the corporation's funds are being used to do those kinds of activities. But having asked that question, I want to put a challenge on the table. You know, earlier I said uh, the foundations aren't allowed to fund lobbying. I didn't say, uh, don't you think it's time for us to revisit that question for ourselves? In 1976, the laws passed that affect what 501c3 public charities, nonprofits, can spend to lobby. 1976, and the cap is a million dollars. So, if you're a very big organization like United Way or the American Red Cross or so, that is a very small amount, and so you'll have very small advocacy offices because the percentage relative to your budget is very small. We didn't say it should be X percent of your budget and it changes with inflation. We haven't touched that. We then said at that time, of, uh, as you know, private foundations are 501c3s. Why can't you use your money to support advocacy? We have accepted that. Mm -hmm. Maybe the time has come for us to begin to look at this and to begin a strategy to say that we think that we should be at the table too. We'll take uh, one more question. Rob Hollister from Tufts University. I 
Our oh, another Massachusetts. <laughs> <laughs> Where I, I wanted to ask the panel to embellish on and to offer specific ideas about how to achieve uh, Sanal Shah's uh, vision of from service to solution. Uh, we know that that's not going to happen automatically. In, a, in an era of, of increasing, perhaps dramatic growth in volunteer service, what particular things can we do in order to make that era pay off as education of future leaders for change? And how do we make that growth pay off in terms of new ways of doing the community business? Oh, yeah, oh, sure. <laughs> Fine. <laughs> when you say, how do we, do you mean we as universities, as Tufts, or I'm trying to understand from what perspective do you want me to speak to this? How do we make service and volunteerism pay off? As uh, corporations and uh, Regardless of our role. Yeah. I think it's a shared opportunity now. Right. No, I love that. Um, and you're not a plant, but I, I love that you, you raised this. Um, First of all, I can speak just to California. I can let you know that there has not yet been any foundation that has invested, I think, the highest investment in AmeriCorps. Um, and this is uh, a program that's the Domestic Peace Corps um, that Sonal spoke of. Um, we have about, between ourselves, our own portfolio, and the National Directs, about eight to 9,000 AmeriCorps members serving in our state. Um, and yet, the largest foundation commitment just with the state portfolio is only I think as high as forty thousand um, dollars that's a lot of, of um, I think uh, opportunity for foundations to help support AmeriCorps approaches to solving community problems and and part of the challenge has been we have not gotten the the community problem solvers together and whether that's an elected official like a mayor or whether that's leading nonprofits, to really better understand how do you really leverage and use this resource? How do we hook you up and broker you with foundations that are interested in investing in this, corporations that want to invest in this? This whole process needs to be made much more vibrant. And, and, um, and I, I know we're really interested and committed to doing that here in California. Um, one of the things we're talking about, for example, is having the very first, I shouldn't probably talk about this, but what the heck, <laughs> um, largest gathering of AmeriCorps um, in the nation um, at the Capitol and have the, the 9,000 AmeriCorps members all turn out on the Capitol steps and have Sacramento a, Capitol. In Sacramento Capitol and be able to demonstrate um, what the exact impacts have been. Like because of these people, this many kids you know, um, stayed in school. This many health, this many healthcare issues were addressed. This many, you know, like go through the impacts because that's what people don't understand. They just think of this as this lovely little year of service that someone does. They just often don't understand not only the, just the value to the community but the value to the individual. But I do think so it is. So go from polite yeah. and warm and fuzzy to impact. To, to impact. Result. I'm talking a rally. I'm right. talking about something very bold. You know, uh, followed up with training. Let's then take the final point I'll make in my vision is to take those 9,000 people and say, okay, let's talk about your next phase of your life. Let's talk about how we need to train you to become effective advocates. How do we train you to go back to your communities and do community gardens? How do you go back and work effectively in school settings? Um, how do you effectively impact economic development? program models, how do you uh, vote, how do you, you know, really use it as... Do you have as, the infrastructure for that? Well, let's just talk about that for a second. <laughs> <laughs> I have only asked one funder so far, and they said yes, um, so I've got one funder. But um, we know that something like that, I mean, when you talk about the vision of that, it's also kind of like taking the power back to the people, in my view. Kind of like we, as Californians, and the partners of the nonprofits where they work and the funding partners of the corporations and the foundations are together solving problems in communities. And that is, is how things are getting done. And that, the vision of that, I think, would be so powerful. 
just got to raise $250,000, but <laughs> that's the vision. But we've got at least some initial interest. Uh, I don't know if that answers your question or if that kind of went on, but I'm particularly well, passionate about this. Jim, we right, and I actually think there's a corporate point of view to share, if I could, on that question. And, and a couple things. One is, I, I think, first of all, corporate, corporations have cadre and army of people that we can leverage. And the one piece that I think is really important is that we could use our bully pu bully pulpit of going out and saying volunteer. Um, you know, I shouldn't probably be saying this right now, but we're going to launch Bank of America, a, a million hour challenge to our employees that you're going to sign up for the month of April, you know, and, and it is a sign up, it's voluntary, right. voluntary, but we really think that we have the appetite in the company to engage employees in meaningful uh, volunteer opportunities. And I think the piece that we're building is really training them so they are impactful. So it's not just go out and paint a wall. It's bring your financial acumen, serve on boards, um, bring um, your skills as a, if you're an HR executive to mentor to kids in school. So we're really trying to develop programs that speak to an individual's strength and, and speaks to the mission of the organization. So I think there, for corporate yeah. America, I think there's huge opportunities. And, and, and quite frankly, we also fund organizations that are steeped in service. Um, you know, for example, like a city year. I mean, yeah. we, we really enable people to serve. And I, and I think that's something that foundations generally do, and it's often forgotten mm -hmm. that, that the funding that foundations provide to these organizations really, really are our way of helping to, the, to make the whole volunteer happen. piece happen. Yeah, right, right. Okay, there was a woman leaping out of her chair there. <laughs> and. and <laughs> You get the last question. Hey, Bob. Make it I'm Jennifer Vianico with the Jacobs Family Foundation in San Diego. And um, since you ask us to dream wild, uh, Bob, I would say that um, probably the thing that I would envision could make the single biggest revolution in philanthropy would be to really fully release the power of our portfolios. And you do see some movement, I think, in recent years um, in that direction. I also wonder if we shouldn't pay more attention to this kind of regulatory barrier between... I'm sorry, Jennifer, just be explicit yeah. about what you mean by that. About releasing the power of yes. our portfolios? Yeah. Well, be, if we're only using, you know, roughly 5% of the assets that we're, we're sitting on, basically, for social change, you know, that's just potentially mind-boggling what could happen if we got 100% of that working for social change. So, or even uh, 20. What's that? Or even yeah, 20. Even 20 yeah, even 20 would be, that would be a great start. Um, the, the other thing that it makes me think of, because we work in neighborhood revitalization and very large scale civic participation of residents in that change, the cost of capital is probably this, the single biggest influencer of people's ability to get stuff done. And if there was a regulatory um, spotlight on what, what uh, trying to remove the barrier that causes the firewall between the banking business side and the charitable philanthropic side of our financial institutions, you know, we could potentially also release great power at the neighborhood level um, to be able to get stuff done. Uh, with that, I want to uh, thank you, Jennifer, for that uh, timely uh, reminder and remark. Um, first things first is um, a round of applause and appreciation for <laughs> Sonal Stop. Sonal, I've concluded that you are the most powerful person in Washington with only a $50 million budget. <laughs> uh, but you're doing, you're doing great work, and we appreciate your leadership. And then a round of appreciation for our terrific panel.